Have you ever been persecuted? What I mean is, have you ever been systematically mistreated, badgered, harassed, tormented, or even tortured for your pursuit of doing what is right in the eyes of God? You see, persecution is real and it's actually promised to us. Maybe you recall the words of Paul in 2 Timothy 3.12 where he says, Indeed, all who desire to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. In other words, for those of us who follow the way of Jesus, we will stand at great odds with those who don't follow Jesus. Author and speaker John Piper gives a lengthy list of how those great odds might look for us. He said, if you pursue chastity, your life will be an attack on people's love for free sex. If you embrace temperance, your life will be a statement against the love of alcohol. If you live simply and happily, you will show the folly of luxury. If you walk humbly with your God, you will expose the evil of pride. And if you speak with compassion, you will throw callousness into sharp relief. And this list goes on and on. If you have watched the news recently, persecution has arrived. It's here. A mass shooting in Pittsburgh is proof of that. And here's a hard truth. We are not called to safety. We are only called to obedience. Believers in India have set the bar high for what it means to follow Jesus Christ. They are beaten for their faith. They are raped for their faith. They are burned alive at the stake for their faith. And because of their incredible perseverance in the face of persecution, that church is thriving. So let me ask you again, have you really been persecuted? If not, you will be. And here is a promise from Jesus himself to those who faithfully follow him. He said that being persecuted for the sake of righteousness means that you will be blessed, really blessed by God. The blessed. El bendito. The blessed. Le bienheureux. L'exécuteur. Ou abençoado. O Jernani. Nehane. Ou abençoado. El bendito. Al The blessed. Today is the International Day of Prayer for the Persecuted Church around the world. In fact, this afternoon at 3 o'clock, you have been invited, Bridge has been personally invited by Ruth Graham to join other area churches at the Stanton Mall in the Old People's Department Store. It's now converted into a place of worship, and at 3 o'clock, you'll, um, you'll join others gathered there to hear stories about persecution and to pray for the persecuted church. There will be uh, praise and worship. I would love for many of our folks here from Bridge to uh, be a part of that. There's no end to the awful and the horrible stories of persecution. It's been happening since the early days of the church. It is happening now. And the scripture predicts that persecution will not end. In fact, it will intensify until the very day that Christ returns. And yet the Bible offers a flip side to the promised persecution, and that is promised blessing. It was James who was the first pastor of the church in Jerusalem who wrote a letter to his flock encouraging them to stand firm in the, in the face of what was tremendous and awful persecution. In James chapter 1, verse 2, he writes this, and it's pretty remarkable what he says. Consider it pure joy, my brothers and sisters, whenever you face trials of many kinds, because you know that the testing of your faith produces perseverance. Let perseverance finish its work so that you may be mature and complete, not lacking anything. What? Wait, wait, you want to start that over? In the face of severe persecution, people being dragged out of their homes, beaten, imprisoned, tortured, killed for their faith, you should count that not only as joy, but pure joy, distilled down joy. That's what he says. 
We should embrace persecution because it makes us grow, it brings us to maturity, makes us complete, lacking nothing. James, what are you saying? What do these words mean? It's tempting to look at this letter written by a loving pastor to his flock and reduce them to just, he's just grabbing for something to encourage these broken people with. But James is actually echoing the words of his brother Jesus from the Beatitudes, the blessed there, the introduction to the Sermon on the Mount. Turn to Matthew 5, 10. 5, 10 through 12, that's where we are today as we come to the final Beatitude. And in this final Beatitude, Jesus is really commenting on everything that's gone before, all the other Beatitudes, the other blessings. He's summarizing them and putting them into this harsh perspective. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. As we've done every Sunday, I want you to repeat that with me. I want you to say it with your own lips. Repeat this. Blessed are those who are persecuted because of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. But here as he comes to the conclusion, he's not finished with this beatitude. He is going to make some further commentary about it. Follow along with me. He repeats it. Blessed are you when people insult you, persecute you, and falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me. Rejoice. Be glad. Because great is your reward in heaven. For in the same way they persecuted the prophets, who were before you. Look at that again. Rejoice, be glad, great is your reward. Are these just poetic yet empty words? Or are they real promises? Real blessing. Persecution has been the nightmare companion of the church since it began. Jesus didn't hedge about predicting it. The apostles picked it up after Jesus was gone, and they predicted it, and they looked ahead through the corridor of history and saw more coming. Listen to Jesus, his words in John 16, 33. In this world, you will have trouble. But take heart, I have overcome the world. By the way, Aren't those words of Jesus right there in stark contrast to one to what some evangelists would tell you? You, If you're a Christian, you're going to be wealthy. You're going to be happy. It's not what Jesus said. In this world, trouble. The Apostle Paul in 1 Thessalonians chapter 3. These are intriguing words. Paul writes, we sent Timothy, who is our brother and co-worker in God's service, in spreading the gospel of Christ, to strengthen and to encourage you in your faith, so that no one would be unsettled by these trials. For you know quite well that we are destined for them. In fact, when we were with you, we kept telling you that we would be persecuted. And it turned out that way as you well know. In the opening monologue, you heard Stephanie talk about persecution is at our door. It's here. And we are about to step off into a message that you don't want to hear on this beautiful Sunday morning in the Shenandoah Valley. I'm about to preach a message that I don't want to preach. Because... As much as we believe the truth that heaven's coming, as much as we believe that the prophets were right in predicting Jesus' first coming, his birth, his his crucifixion, his resurrection, his second coming, as much as God's people believe in the promises of the word, we have to believe this promise that we will be persecuted. You know what? All my life I've lived in a bubble. So have you. We heard stories from India and Africa and China about persecution, deadly, 
harsh persecution. If you've been a student of Bible history, you know it has always been that nightmare companion. And yet, it won't happen here. It couldn't happen here. But it's beginning. Listen, this is a hard message for me to give you because I have children and I have grandchildren and I worry about what their future is going to be. Can I give you a measure of how fast things are changing? Some of you that are my age, could you have imagined when you were a child in, school, in church that churches were going to have to recruit and train and train armed security for church service. We have them here today. We're having armed security at every church service here. Is it a lack of faith? No, it is prudent. We have to. Did you think that day would ever be here in a generation? And what might the next generation be? Pastors and church leaders are having this discussion. If things continue the way they're going, will there be a drop-off in church attendance, not because of faithlessness, but because moms and dad, dads will worry church is one of the most dangerous places to attend in our town. Persecution is coming. It was predicted. Jesus talked about it. The apostles talked about it. And uh, that door is opening in our own country. And listen, it is not a question of if. It is a question of when. I would not be a faithful pastor if I didn't preach this harsh, harsh message. You know, we've enjoyed all of the Beatitudes. And when it comes to the bottom line, this is what Jesus says. And blessed are the persecuted. We have to be ready. And we have to take advantage of a window that's closing. I feel this almost every day. In this beautiful place where we live, where we worship, where I serve, I feel like a window is slowly closing on such rich opportunity. And I want to make sure I take advantage of that window while it's open before it slams shut. Every one of us in here should be ardent in our fervor to share Christ with others before that window of opportunity closes. And you may be here thinking that it would never happen. And there have been churches and communities overrun by the enemy who thought it could never happen. The Bible says this about Satan, who's leading this charge. Satan also knows the Bible, and he knows what the prophets say. And the Bible says this about him. He is furious he is filled with fury because he knows his time is short. And as the time gets shorter and shorter until the Lord's return, we can bet that he is going to get more and more furious at the bride of Christ, the church of God. I want you to turn to Matthew 24. This is one of the most important chapters in the Bible. Jesus was asked by his disciples, Lord, tell us, what should we prepare for? What should we look for? What are the signs of your coming in the end of the age? And he told them, there will be famines, there will be earthquakes, there will be pestilence, there will be distress in nations, like a woman going into childbirth pain. The pain will come um, with greater intensity and, and, uh, and in, an increased frequency. And then this prophecy, watch for this, he said. Then you will be handed over to be persecuted and put to death. And you will be hated by all nations because of me. 
At that time, many will turn away from the faith and will betray and hate each other. And many false prophets will appear and deceive many people. He goes on, because of the increase of wickedness. Can I stop right there? Doesn't that sound like the world you're living in? The increase of wickedness. The love of most will grow cold. But the one who stands firm to the end will be saved. And you're here this morning asking yourself questions like these. Why does it have to be this way? Why does it have to happen at all? I didn't become a follower of Christ to be beaten, imprisoned, tortured, or killed. You may be here this morning hearing this message thinking, really? Where's the blessing in that? Yet over and over, Jesus' words, that exact term, blessed, are repeated in the New Testament. I'm going to go pretty quick here. You might not have time to turn to these scriptures. Just write them down. James 1.12, blessed is the one who perseveres under trial because having stood the test, that person will receive the crown of life that the Lord has promised to those who love him. Later, James 5.10, Brothers and sisters, as an example of patience in the face of suffering, take the prophets who spoke in the name of the Lord. As you know, we count as blessed those who have persevered. Later in the New Testament, the Apostle Peter writing, 1 Peter 3.14, But even if you should suffer for what is right, you are blessed. Blessed. Do not fear their threats. Don't be frightened. But in your hearts, revere Christ as Lord. 1 Peter 4. Dear friends, don't be surprised at the fiery ordeal that has come on you to test you, as though something strange were happening to you. But rejoice inasmuch as you participate in the sufferings of Christ, so that you may be overjoyed when his glory is revealed. If you are insulted because of the name of Christ, you are blessed, for the spirit of glory and of God rests upon you. If you suffer, it shouldn't be as a murderer or a thief or a criminal or a meddler. However, if you suffer as a Christian, do not be ashamed. But praise God that you bear that name. Those who bear the name of Jesus will be persecuted. And you picked up that cross when you made Jesus the Lord of your life. And maybe we didn't do our work. Maybe we didn't give you the full counsel. Maybe we should have warned you that if you bear the name Christians, you will be hated by all nations. Maybe we, we, we should have taken a little more time to help you count the cost of what you're signing up for because it is about cross-bearing. It is about sharing in the sufferings of Christ. It is about persecution. It is about the possibility of losing everything, even life, because Christ is Lord of your life. I want to show you a picture of the Roman Colosseum. We talked about this last week, and I told you the, told you the story of the 4th century monk, Telemachus. You can go to these ruins. You can have a tour there. And I was reading an author named Ron, uh, named uh, Paul Rader, who was in a tour group. He's a Christian author, and he was sharing his thoughts and his feelings about being in that awful yet sacred place where so many Christians died. And as he looked around where tens of thousands would shout in glee for the death of entire Christian families, either by the lions, the wild animals, or the gladiators, he thought to himself, could I do that? Could I be faithful unto that kind of death? 
Could I walk calmly, hand in hand with my wife and my children into the circus, it was called. He recounted that eyewitnesses of the time wrote that many of those Christians walked calmly singing hymns with smiles on their faces and a supernatural radiance about them. And he was puzzled. And Rader wrote these words, here is the difference between them and me. The quotes on the screen, they lived on the threshold of heaven within a heartbeat of home. Isn't that beautiful? They were different than me because they lived their lives on the threshold of heaven, just a heartbeat from home. What is your heartbeat for? Where do you live most of your life? What consumes you? Pleasure? accruing wealth, homes and cars, stuff? Or do you live with a certain reckless abandon right on the edge of the doorway of this life and just a step across to glory, just a heartbeat away from the face of Jesus, your Savior? It's coming. The signs of it are everywhere. The windows are closing. We need to be ready. We need to be prepared. We need to take inventory. And we need to change where we live and how our heart beats. I want to hurry on. Let me close. Romans 8, 17. I wish you'd turn there if you have your Bible. Romans 8, 17. Another promise, a glorious promise to the persecuted. Now, if we are children, then we are heirs, heirs of God and co-heirs with Christ, if indeed we share in his sufferings in order that we may also share in his glory. And I consider that our present sufferings are not worth comparing with the glory that will be revealed in us. In 1900, there was a war in China called the Boxer Rebellion. And um, communist insurgents gathered around a little mission compound, uh, around a little school Chinese nationals were being instructed there and uh, taught there and learning about Christ there. And uh, these communists hated the mission, the missionaries, and these children with their faith. The, the building was filled with around 100 what we would call middle school students. They, uh, they posted a guard at every exit and closed off all the gates to the compound except for one. And then the, the commander of the group shouted this through the open windows to the terrified teachers and students. We have placed a wooden cross at the only exit. If you will come out the door to the cross, spit on it, and step on it, we will let you live. If you don't and choose to walk around it, we will put you to the firing squad. You can imagine those children inside that school. What an awful predicament for those children of faith. And shortly, one student and then another and then another and then another, seven in all, in fear, went to that gate, they spat on the cross, trampled him, and 
walk to freedom. Eyewitnesses says, eyewitnesses say one young middle school girl came to that gate and knelt down in the dust and kissed the cross, stood up and walked around it, and she was grabbed and put up against the wall and shot. But then 98 other students, one by one, followed her example to their death. We've had it so good for so long. It is unthinkable that our middle school students could be put to such a test. Can I say it again? This is not good news. It's just true. It's not a question of if, but when. And we must be ready. And we must make our children ready. And we must decide we are going to stand firm. You will never need the church as desperately as you will during days of persecution. Let me close with this final encouragement from the Hebrew writer. This is Hebrews 12, 2. Speaking of Jesus, for the joy set before him he endured the cross, scorning its shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Consider him who endured such opposition from sinners so that you will not grow weary and lose heart. If you're a guest today, I want you to know that every Sunday here at Bridge, at about this time in our service, we pause for a time of communion, a time of the Lord's Supper, we call it. In a minute, the lights will dim, some soft music play, will play, and we will share in a simple meal the bread and, and the cup. Some instructions will be on the screen behind me. Listen, these should be the most holy moments of your week. We're about to have a supernatural encounter here. I want you to put things out of your hands. Put your phone away. Put your checkbook, your pen away. And listen to what the Holy Spirit is going to say to you in these next few moments. This is going to be an opportunity for us all as we commune to remember the cross and the price that he paid. But it's also going to be a moment, a time for us to take inventory ourselves. Where is our heart? What does it beat for? Where do we stand? And it's a time for us to pray. Lord, make me ready. Lord, keep the window open and I will be a faithful and diligent minister until it closes. Bow with me. Lord Jesus, for your great gift, we're, we will be eternally grateful. And as we have sung songs of praise this morning, we will forever in glory, wearing crowns of righteousness, proclaim your goodness. Heavenly Father, for your great love in sending a rescuer, a savior, we are humbled that you would love us that much. And Father, we turn our thoughts now to the persecuted throughout the ages and those that are right now suffering at the hands of tormentors and jailers and killers. Lord, help them come to their rescue, stand beside them, Walk through that fiery trial with them. We pray for them and we pray for ourselves that in that day we will stand tall and we will stand firm. 
Now, Holy Spirit, overshadow us. Overwhelm us with your presence, speaking to every mind and every heart. In the name of Jesus, amen.